thank you also Francoise for uh, introducing me and for um, allowing me to give this talk about my research on Tibetan typefaces. Um, I will concentrate on uh, this region, uh, which is mainly the Himalayas, which I just want to show you um, uh, the piece of the, uh, the part of the world um, where uh, the Tibetan language is spoken, written, um, and been distributed all over the world from this. But here is the largest uh, concentration of the area where uh, the Tibetan language and also the Tibetan script is um, yeah, used, basically. So it's uh, the north part um, of uh, the Himalayas and surroundings. Um, I know that um, the Institute of Tibetan Studies, you of course will know more about the whole uh, tradition on Tibetan studies and the development of the language and the writing system of Tibetan. So I won't go into much detail there. Um, but it's um, usually assumed um, that in the seventh century, um, the king Songtsen Gampo, which you see on the right, an image of, um, he was the person actually united the different tribes and founded Tibet. And at the same time, uh, for the reasons of trading, um, he also wanted to have its own writing system. So not to uh, rely on the scripts or writing systems that were in use in the area. So he sent Tonmi Sambota, and that's the image you see on the left side, um, the guy with uh, manuscripts on his lap. He sent uh, Tonmi Sambota to the north of India, where he studied some uh, writing systems based on the Gupta script. It's a North Indian writing system to study the characteristics, the study, uh, uh, the structure of the writing system, and to come back to uh, Tibet at that time, now Tibetan Autonomous Region. Um, and develop its own writing system. Here you can see one of the earliest examples of the engravings of or the Tibetan script in use. Uh, it's a stele, or we call it like a, um, a stone pillar in front of the temples. It's in the center of uh, Lhasa at the Yokang uh, temple, which has presumably one of the earliest surviving um, examples of the Tibetan script in use. Um, the left photo is a bit more contemporary, but on the right hand side, there are some stills of some uh, documentaries uh, that have been broadcast on international television. So these are examples from the 1950s and 60s um, already. But um, at the very first start in the middle of the 7th century, uh, there existed two different styles of Tibetan writing. Uh, one is called the U Chen script, and that's the one that you can see here. And it means um, that it carries basically some characteristics of um, some Gupta or Brahmi derived writing systems of North India. And that's this horizontal headline that you can see here on top um, of all of the characters. If you see the detail on the lower part of the image, it's the black line um, that's been highlighted. And that's what we call the heads um, in the Tibetan script. And that's why the script with the heads uh, or Uchen. Uchen is mainly used for manuscripts. Here you can see a manuscript written with silver ink um, or with gold inking. Uh, it's also decorated uh, to produce different kinds of uh, literature and scriptures. Here you can see more like calligraphic styles, like it's more um, not official scribes, uh, but calligraphers and also um, not to sound too disrespectful, but ordinary people who would use it to write formal and official letters to each other. So it takes more time to write. It takes more uh, time to stylize, to organize the different lines on the page. But at the same time, uh, the U Chen script, um, still the same writing system, is also used, for instance, in carving into stone. So here you have a chisel, and that's what we call, we carve it literally into the stone. Uh, it's a beautiful image that I took in Lhasa a few years ago um, of a lady who her profession is really to write mani stones, which go around the temple and around Buddhist um, um, circumambulation. So it's around walk that you do um, for um, um, auspicious reasons. Um, to say prayers or thank you or um, ask for anything. Um, so she engraves it there. But on the same hand, you can also see very large, beautiful lettering. And lettering is actually hand painted um, or hand drawn letters in big size on boulders, like the stones in the Himalaya build, um, mountains. And you can see an example um, uh, in the north part of India in Ladakh. 
so it's another region of Tibet itself. So you can see that the script is used in various sizes, uh, but always uh, to do with official kind of text or literature. At the same time, um, also the more informal or shorthand uh, script was developed also by the same Tonmi Sambota. And here, um, the actually, uh, uh, the script is called Ume, and it's called that the headline is removed. So at the top of the line uh, of the characters, you don't see this headline anymore. So it's a more loose form of writing the text. It's like shorthand, it's actually to write more quick notes to each other, more informal text. Um, if I would write a letter to my mother, or if I would write a list to go to the grocery or the market to buy some food, I would write it in Ume and not in the official um, Uchen style. It's this specific Ume style that you see here that afterwards has been uh, developed in more than 10 different sorts of calligraphy. And this also has to do with what kind of text was written um, because calligraphy it's more artistic, it takes more time, it's more precious, so depending on whether it's a beautiful golden letter to His Holiness the Dalai Lama, or whether it's like a translated text from an Indian Sanskrit into Tibetan, they would use a different style of um, calligraphy. Um, here you see the different names. I'm happy to share the names and um, anything afterwards with you if you need any of the, of the, source, of the sources, which is fine. Um, but um, in general, the Tibetan script is written horizontally. It's going from left to right, uh, horizontally next to, next to each character is positioned next to each other, left to right. But because it's an alpha syllabary writing system, which means that each character or combination of characters that you see is producing a syllable, it means that it has a different sound, uh, one specific sound already inherent in, in the pronunciation. So every word that you see of character that you see has the A sound included in um, itself. But um, if you want to change the sound or if you want to change the meaning of a homonym, it is the same word that is pronounced the same way, but the meaning is different. You can stack different characters on top of each other. So. Although the Tibetan writing system is written horizontally from left to right, the conjuncts, it's like go vertically. And that's what makes it a bit um, challenging. So it's not complicated because once you know the system, it's easy to use and children use it in Tibet and any, or Bhutan or anywhere else. Uh, but in terms of printing, which I come back to later, it's more challenging to actually produce these individual vertical combinations. And it's always the root letter that has the sound. So you can see that ka, it's the first letter of the Tibetan writing system, which is the root letter. But you can see that um, a character can be positioned to the left of it, to the right of it, even post suffix to the other right of it. And on top or below the root letter ka, you can have some other um, ones of the 30 base characters or vowel signs to change the term from a to o which is the top one um, on the very top of it, the narro, if you can read it. Um, then the sounds changes from A to O. You can also have a sound, the sabchu, which goes at the bottom of the conjunct, and then the sound becomes a U, for instance. Um, so that's in general, um, whether it's Ume or Uchen, the, the style of writing that uh, the script is, or the structure of writing that the script is used. We have specific different zones um, of the Tibetan characters. And that's necessary to actually not only print the text, but also when you write text or make calligraphy, it's in order to organize the consecutive lines that go underneath each other. Uh, because the headline, and I come back to it in a moment, because it's the script that is used more for printing and also for official letters. The headline also has to be aligned each time at the base character height. So it's like, I always like to compare it with laundry that's hanging on a line. Uh, so each of the characters needs to hang from that washing line, basically. And then you have got stacking on top of it. It's not denigrating, but it's a beautiful, I think, easy way to explain because, for instance, to make a comparison with Latin, each of our characters are sitting down on the baseline. So that's different in North Indian scripts or South Asian writing systems. A lot of writing systems hangs from the headline. In uh, the West, it's more the, yeah, that they are sitting on the baseline, basically. There are some specific um, 
yeah, notifications to actually tell the different proportions of how each of the characters should be written, um, not beautifully, but it's the standardized form. So there are some very beautiful um, manuals and um, primers that scribes and also calligraphers, but also stone cutters have been developed. Uh, the original ones were all in wood block printing. I'll come back to that in a moment. And if you look back, uh, if I made a translation together with some Tibetan translators of each of the terms, and you can see that each individual stroke of each Tibetan character has a specific meaning. And you can see one stroke or one line that goes down is called the shoulder. The other one, which is bending downwards, is called the belly. We have the neck. We have the eye, we have uh, the arm, also the collarbone, which is, um, if you see, for instance, uh, on the lower line, just on top of anatomy, uh, the character, the second one from the left, uh, the collarbone is this connecting stroke that goes from uh, the arm, basically, uh, to the belly. So it's a beautiful connotation. You've got the ab abdomen uh, and you name it. Um, but when I was, for instance, explaining um, different characteristics to discuss typefaces or fonts um, and the difference is that the typeface is an individual style of a design and a font is a digital um, um, variation of a typeface, so especially for computing area, I'll come back to that in a moment. Um, I had to use these different terms to explain if you want to design uh, whether the car needs to be larger or whether the collarbone needs to be extended, whether the eye should be closer. And when I was doing this, most people were thinking that I was talking to a doctor or dissecting an animal or something. So in terms of the research and also the book, I had to standardize a few names and make it more clearer for typography uh, or typographer users. And it's basically um, using the terms that we share with other kind of um, characters. Uh, for instance, the headline we call headline. Instead of the short arm or the long arm, we call the um, tapering vertical going down stroke a stem. It's the same in Latin, like all the, the vertical strokes we call stems as well, regardless of the language that we use. Um, and vice versa. And that makes it more easier to communicate uh, in terms of um, um, that typography, basically. So we got the roundings, the superscripts, subscripts, and you name it. The talk that I'll be giving, continuation of the talk I'll be uh, giving today, will concentrate on uh, creating typefaces for printing types. And printing types um, are indeed the device uh, with the printing press. Uh, which was invented uh, in Germany by Gutenberg in 1450 or by Koster in Haarlem at around the same time. There's two um, uh, explanations possible. Um, but that's indeed a Western invention. Um, in Tibet, the printing press was never uh, active. So it never found a solid ground in Tibet or the surroundings. They never use printing with a printing press. Um, also in uh, Korea, of course, we had uh, movable type, which was invented many centuries before the invention of the Gutenberg printing press. But most of the printing that was done in Tibet was done in this specific way. That's by woodblock engravings, or we call it in yeah, technical terms, xylography. Um, the woodblocks are engraved by hand as well. So each of the texts, as you can see oops, here, uh, at the library of one of uh, the monasteries, it's Serra Monastery in Lhasa, which I had the opportunity to visit as well a few years ago. Like each of the pages of the book is hand carved on both ways. So it's really a task and a beautiful craftsmanship that you need to master in order to beautifully engrave everything. So this is not carved, this is really engraved by making use of different kinds of chisels um, rather than the lady that you saw earlier, she was really like carving everything away. This is chiseling away. Um, and here you see the specific style of a detail of one of these wooden wood blocks and uh, that you have a more refined angular style of this uh, specific um, yeah, Uchen uh, writing system that's been used uh, in printing. So the printing press was never used uh, in Tibet, but the first one um, that actually, um, or the first printing office, I have to say, that actually made a printing type for the Tibetan writing system 
um, is the one from the Sacra Congregatio de Propaganda Fide Press in Rome. And it was a printing press, as you can imagine. It was to actually um, print all religious work that came from the Vatican in Rome um, um, that had to be translated in many writing systems of the world for obvious reasons, uh, so that they could spread the world all around the world. Um, and it's not until 1738 that the first ever metal Tibetan printing type was hand carved. And that's the one that you see here. Uh, it's a printing type that was um, made, manufactured by Antonio Fantautius. Uh, you can see in the quote Antonio Fantautio. Um, and he was a punch cutter uh, for um, the printing office and the type foundry of the Sacra Congregatio de Propaganda Fide Press in Rome. Is punch cutter in French? Uh, punch cutter is graveur de poinçon. Okay. Well, so I'll come back to it later, but it's good that you ask it uh, because um, we call a punch in English a poinçon in French. And there's a very beautiful collection that you have still housed here in Paris, but I think it might be moved even um, different, but you will see beautiful examples in a minute, which has a big collection and um, it's called the Cabinet de Poinçon from the Imprimerie Nationale, formerly Imprimerie Royal. Um, Etc. and primary imperial. Uh, but it's the same kind of situation that you can have to think yourself in. We are 1738. Fontazio was a Roman uh, Italian uh, punch cutter, uh, graveur de poinçon. Of course, he did not go to Tibet to carve uh, the uh, or to, to study the script. So he actually used um, the, the drawings or the models from Horatio. Um, uh, who actually studied the writing system uh, back in those days. And you can see like a detail now of the first printing pr uh, type for uh, Tibetan here, it's the syllabary and it's indeed used uh, to print the very first dictionary we can call it. It's called the Alphabetum Tibetanum, which was not published until uh, 1759 and a later updated edition in 1762. But um, it gives the annotation that it was indeed Fantazio he made them. But what you can already see from this example, it's a detail from some of the pages, is that this Tibetan type is very primitive. It's the first example. The proportions are very big. Um, you can see that even at some points, it's a bit difficult because with sharing the screen, I cannot highlight anything here. But I'll try to do it on the screen at the back. You can see that. Fontatius actually made some very, um, uh, took the liberty to make very, there are his own kind of decisions. And we use, for instance, a very triangular shape, very abstract formation to one of the beautiful uh, uh, yeah, proportions or aspects of the Tibetan writing system, which he actually reduced to something very yeah, basic and geometric. The second aspect is that you can see the different big gaps between the different consecutive lines. And that's because he actually, for the conjuncts, the vertical conjuncts that I explained earlier, that he actually used one specific character, a sort, we call it as well. It's one sort is one character which was cast in metal. Um, so, and one of these is called a sort, like it's a metal type basically. So each of these individual characters are individual sorts. I'll explain it in a moment as well. But he had to use them underneath each other to produce the text. So you can see even on the example on the right uh, that if you would combine multi-script typography with for instance, Chinese and Mongolian, that the lines are going wider and shorter uh, uh, to each other. And it's not very well. Um, proceeded. But on the other end, it's the first one. It's a good effort. And of course, we could print with um, letterpress typography and some text also to the West. So the Alphabetum Tibetanum is one example. Uh, but in 1762, uh, there was also a very beautiful um, type specimen book from this propaganda press, of which you can see an example on the right, which actually displays the different um, collections of this um, type foundry, and the type foundry is really that part of the printing press that keeps all uh, the punches, the poinçons, and uh, the, the cast type together. 
and to display 1762. That's uh, the example from the specimen on the right hand side, like the black and white page. Yes, indeed, yes. So that's the Syriac uh, found Tartar and Tibetan, uh, Tibetan on the right hand side. And it's actually to show for the typesetters or the printers, which how each of the typefaces would look what they have in the printing press. That's what most of the printing presses did. In this case, it was only the propaganda press who was using this typeface. It was not sold to other printing presses in Italy or anywhere else in the, in the world. Here you can see an example of the actual Poinçons. And these are images that um, were kindly given to me by Christian Papu. And Christian Papu is one of the surviving um, punch cutters or, or graveur de Poinçons from the um, Imprimerie Nationale. He's now retired and Nelly Gable took over his job in the Imprimerie Nationale. And they are still um, with some apprentices preserving the collection of the Imprimerie Nationale in Paris um, um, to preserve it to, if there are some um, I should, restorations needed that they actually can um, make them. Um, and he was kind enough to provide me with these images. I was also privileged, uh, I have to say, to have had a guided tour of uh, the whole collection there um, back in 2005, so about 15, 16 years ago already. Um, but the reason that I'm showing this here is that although that it's an Italian typeface from Rome, that the material is preserved in France, in Paris. And that's because of Napoleon. When Napoleon was actually like, how do, how do I say, um, moving around in Europe, he wanted to have um, from each of the important printing houses or artifacts to bring it back to France. And a large collection of these original punches, because these are the unique ones, it's the only ones that exist. Um, um, he took them back to France to be preserved in his uh, printing office and printing press. It's not the only one, there's quite a lot of them still, but um, here you can see, for instance, um, the collection of the Tibetan punches originating from Rome from Fontatius. I'm pleased and happy that they are still preserved, but yeah, just to know that uh, they're not original from here, uh, from here, I mean, in, in, from Paris, but it's good. So that's how they come that they ended up here. Um, a second example, because I'm going to move a little bit faster as well, but um, is um, that Jean-Baptiste Bodoni, it's a very known name, Bodoni, it's a very, it's a printer and, sorry, punch cutter and type founder from Parma, also in Italy, um, was also someone, he produced some Tibetan typefaces. Um, he already was um, familiar with the archive from uh, the propaganda press, and that's because his grandfather was actually working there. His grandfather was actually composing texts with the metal type. Um, to produce the text for the propaganda press. And uh, he often visited he, his grandfather there and he often had the job to clean all the, the, the metal type and the punches and everything. So when he was asked to actually produce a publication for the baptism of the Prince of Parma, um, he actually um, chose or was inspired by the typefaces from the collection in Rome. So he actually copied the one from Fantautius from the Alphabetum Tibetanum and almost used exactly the same kind of shapes, the same kind of style, also the mistakes because of this triangular shape and everything. And he copied it into his own collection. He was the first one who made two different sizes or two different type sizes, which you can see on the right-hand side. Uh, it's an, it's um, a copy, or and it's not a copy, but it's a scan from um, his type specimen book, the Manuale Typografico. And you can see that there is a Sulla Philosophia and a Sul Testo. So the Sul Testo is the lower one, which is the larger size, and the Sulla Philosophia is a smaller size of the Tibetan that he uh, cut and designed. Again, he was the only one who used his own um, Tibetan typefaces uh, in a specimen book, but also in 19, sorry, 1806 to produce all the translations of the Pater Noster um, in all the different writing systems that were possible. Um, and it was actually a gift for uh, the Pope. I forgot his name at the time who challenged him. Uh, I can come back to it in a moment. Um, um, but um, if a year before, um, there was an, um, also like a translation of the Pater Noster produced here in France. 
but um, the printer made use of uh, lithography, like uh, an engraving plate, so copper plates engravings. Um, and Bodoni wanted to show off and do better. So what he did, he wanted to make all the types himself and engrave them in type as well. So that's like, it was a year later and it's what's happening today with application and software as well. If something is on the market, next year someone else wants to do a better job and everything. So that's basically what, what Bodoni was doing. But the type was, apart from his type specimen book or these few publications to, which were created as kind of um, a show of um, only by himself. Um, it's only a bit later that um, the typefaces were produced to actually creating um, publications for learning the Tibetan language and learning the Tibetan script. And the first example we can find is an example from the Serampore Press in India, which was a missionary press. Um, and it's a book uh, dictionary of the Bota or Bhutan language uh, from 1926. Um, which was printed then at the same time. Um, and the missionary press um, had its own uh, punch cutter as well, Graveur de Poinçon, which was Punchanan uh, Manohar. Um, but it was actually um, his apprentice, Manohar, who actually was given the job to, the, to cut and design the printing types for the Tibetan. He was the apprentice and son in law of Manohar. Uh, oh, sorry, Panchanan. And for this Indian printing press, it was in this case an Indian punch cutter that actually produced the type. But again, you can see that he was very much influenced by the Alphabetum Tibetanum. Now, of course, it is logical because at that time it was the only books printed with metal type and being a missionary press, of course, they would have known the alphabet in Tibetanum, probably have taken it with them to uh, Serampur, which is the east part of India, close to Calcutta, where the missionary was uh, located. Um, but here it was really like the first um, dictionary that actually translated terms from Tibetan into English. You can see that there were also some mistakes, but the improvement here, although that the proportions and the shapes are not improved, the improvement itself is that Manohar actually chose to combine different characters together and create one individual punch by hand of these two or three or four more characters. Instead of using the different ones underneath, you have one single punch or metal sword in which those two, three or four characters were combined, which is an improvement, but because the typesetter only had to use one metal sword instead of four, and it was easier to, to do handset. Pre -composed. Pre -composed, yes, yeah, yeah, indeed. Um, a few years later, another missionary, because the Serampur press was not the only one who was a missionary press at uh, the mid 19th century, um, a little bit nearby uh, in Calcutta itself, uh, there's the Baptist mission press. For the same reasons, uh, they also were translating works. Um, but Alexander Xoma de Xoros was a Hungarian uh, linguist. Uh, he was actually at that time looking for the roots of the Hungarian language and the Hungarian people. And he traveled, he wanted to travel all the way to uh, Russia via Siberia and even uh, by Mongolia and everything that he wanted to travel there to see it. And he ended up in Ladakh. And that's where he met a specific guy, Moorcroft, um, who gave him some funds, some money to proceed in his um, in his travels. And in return, Alexander Xoma de Kurosh, being in Ladakh, North India, where also the Tibetan language is used, promised that in return of the 300 rupees that he was given, he promised to make, write, and also print a grammar book and a dictionary in the Tibetan language for uh, this person. So in 1834, when he was back um, at uh, Calcutta in the Baptist Missionary Press, he had indeed studied the Tibetan language and there was um, high Tibetan Lama from um, Zanskar Monastery in Ladakh, which helped him with um, yeah, creating the shapes of the characters. And what is very beautiful here, that in um, the example, which you can see on the right, yes, I made a close up of it. I wasn't sure because I couldn't see um, immediately, is that you can see that the characters of Choma are almost handwritten. It's almost calligraphy. 
And there is one page at some um, dictionary in which he used a lithographic uh, example, which you can see that it was either the handwriting of that Tibetan Lama from the monastery or the handwriting of uh, Ptoma himself that was used as a model to create these new printing types. And here the shapes are very better executed. The curves are more elegant. He actually makes proper use of the four or the three different strokes and not uh, the triangular shape and everything. So in this case, it was an original typeface. It was not a copy like Manohar did or Bodoni did. It was completely new. Also, Russia was very important in the spread of uh, Tibetan literature. Um, the Academy of Sciences in St. Petersburg uh, already at, um, in the earliest or the first quarter of the 19th century, at that time, the largest collection of Asian literature in their libraries. Um, I can give you the details later, but it would take me too much away how they were achieved, uh, how they were acquired. But it was at that time the largest collection of manuscripts, um, boot block printed books, not only from uh, Tibet, but also from China, from India, from uh, Singapore, from uh, ben uh, Bengal, and um, you name it, Bhutan. Um, and Isaac Jacob Schmidt uh, was given the task uh, because he was um, at that specific moment um, head of the um, Bible, the Russian Bible Society. He was actually given the task to translate um, um, the, uh, the Bible into Tibetan as well. But I would like to tell a little bit more context about Isaac Jacob Schmidt because he's a very important linguist. He was born in Amsterdam and he was actually being... Uh, trained as being a merchant, like a trader, like uh, to sell things in markets. Um, and he, he also wanted, uh, was traveling around um, Siberia and, and Russia. Um, and he even went to Kalmukia and North Mongolia. He actually lived amongst the Mongolian nomads. And when he came back to uh, Russia and was being uh, given the position of the head of the uh, Russian Bible Society, the first thing he did in 1815 uh, was the task of translating the New Testament into Mongolian Kalmuki. And therefore, he produced and designed the first Mongolian printing type. It was used for the, the Bible, but also to create a Mongolian grammar book and a Mongolian dictionary. So in terms of Tibetan studies and Mongolian studies. Isaac Jakob Schmidt is a very renowned man, person, uh, and known for, for his linguistic work. And of course, before translating the Bible, he also had to learn the scripts, know the grammar, how it's done. So before the translations, it were these uh, linguistic books that were produced. I told you uh, in 1815, it was a Mongolian translation, but it's only a few later, years later, as in 18. 39, that he produced uh, both uh, the Tibetan grammar in Russian and Tibetan, but also in German and Tibetan. And a bit later afterwards, also the grammar book, uh, in which you can see some examples here. Um, and here as well, it was an original typeface. Um, he was also the first one who made the distinction between uh, secondary weights and a secondary weight means in typography terms is that you have one style of a typeface which is used for the body text, like all the text that you can read. But if you have a title or you have a footnote, it's a style that can be either bold, like uh, more fatter, or light or italic. And that's these styles we call secondary. And he also made a secondary style of the same typeface because the shapes are identical but he enlarged them to be used for titles. And that you can see on these pages that the body text is the one which has the regular size and normally it's about 12 points like Cicero. And the top one, the secondary weight is like the display or the title uh, typeface, uh, which is around 16 points uh, size. A very beautiful execution um, of a linguistic work that he did um, was uh, in which the typeface was used. I'll come back to you in a moment, if you don't mind. Um, is this a beautiful encyclopedia um, from Kowaleski. It's from 1844, and it's from the Kazan University in Russia. 
But what's very remarkable here, it's like an encyclopedia. It's, uh, it has three different volumes. And each volume is about the size, like 400 pages, like the size of, of, of this book. It's about the same size as well. Um, like it's a little bit smaller than an A4. But you have to remember that every text you see here is handset piece by piece. And what this page shows is that you have Mongolian, which is the vertical text on the left. So everything has to be composed vertically. You have Russian, you have even translations in French. You can see it uh, some of the pages, and you also he also provided like sometimes translations into Tibetan, and that's I get I, I don't know it for sure, but it might be the origin of the word that might uh, come from like etymological reasons comes from Tibetan um, or has some connection. So it's, some of the words are also translated into Tibetan. So it's a different talk to dissect each of the lines and how they are handset. And if you know that it's three different pages, uh, so three different volumes, each of the volumes, um, like about 400 pages, it's really mind blowing. And even with today's software uh, that's available, it's very difficult to achieve the typesetting with all the different digital fonts with a, a word processor who can typeset vertically, horizontally, from left to right at the same time. So I would challenge anyone to do this. Um, of course, it's possible, but it takes a lot of effort. Um, but I only admire people at that time who would do it by hand. And that's a very beautiful task. So if you have the chance to see this volume, and I'm sure that there is some in the uh, library here from uh, Mitterrand, like um, the, the library. Yeah. So um, I would really advise to look at it. It's beautiful. But in terms of designing a contemporary nowadays typeface for computers or for applications or smartphones or tablets, the type specimen books of the Academy Press of Sciences uh, from Isaac Jacob Schmidt, I mean, from the typefaces they showed, actually show some very interesting samples. Because what you can see on this page is um, a page from the larger size, like the 16 point Tibetan type size. And it also shows the 325 individual punches that were hand carved uh, to typeset. Tibetan text. And that's important because here you can see whether we need these conjuncts as ligatures in nowadays computing or type, this typeface design, or whether you can design it individually and have them being created automatically. So this really gives a way also for other printing um, type foundries and printing presses at the same time, how you can actually start with, these are the characters needed for typesetting at that time classical but also uh, contemporary Tibetan. Marcelin Legrand, the punch cutter from the Imprimerie Royale, um, um, also designed two, even three different ones, but the third one is not really sure why or how it was used for Tibetan. And Marcelin Legrand was actually the nephew of a very important um, type founders uh, and punch cutting family. Uh, it's the Didot family in Paris, which I'm sure each one of you know. And Henri Didot, it's one of the, uh, the punch cutters of the family, was the uncle of Marcelin Legrand. And Marcelin Legrand uh, was his apprentice. And when Henri Didot died, he took over the company, like the firm of Henri Didot. And in 1825, he was actually, um, given, no, how should I say, he was introduced in the Imprerie Royale because they asked him to produce um, a large uh, set of Latin type families um, for Charles the, the Fifth, if I'm not mistaken. Um, so he actually started working there uh, at the Imprerie Royale. But with the help of many Orientalists, linguists, uh, academics, he also produced quite a lot of write typefaces for different writing systems of the world. He produced, as I just said, for instance, uh, two or three sizes of Tibetan, but he also did some beautiful Arabic typefaces, uh, Maghribi um, and other typefaces. So it's a very important um, designer, uh, especially in the, in the history of French typography, punch cutting uh, and printing academic uh, publications with newly designed uh, typefaces. Um, here you can see some of the type cases uh, that are uh, used or shown. Um, and this was actually to show to the printer once the typeface is finished, 
um, it can be used by different printers and all the individual sorts because you have, it's not one that you need for even in Latin, the lowercase e or the a. It's not one a that you need in the whole text. You need hundreds of a's uh, in a text. So each of these individual sorts, again, that's I come back to the word term sort. It's a metal piece of type need to be collected in wooden type cases. Um, and here you can see the example from the Imprimerie Royale, now Imprimerie Nationale, that explains where each of the individual characters need to be um, located or positioned in the type case, so that it can be easily uh, typeset. Um, on the left-hand side, you can see some of the punches of this third. Um, it's only a, a small size, and so parti, a parti from a very large display size that Marcel Legrand uh, designed. Uh, probably it was only to design uh, types of some titles from one of the Tibetan works that he did, and he didn't need more characters. So he only designed the ones that were needed for the titles. But anyway, you can see all these details uh, in beautiful, uh, in real life, in uh, the archives of the uh, Cabinet Poinçon. And um, sorry, I'll come back to it later. Um, we don't have really any sources of where he modeled his typefaces on, but if you look very closely to the shapes, you can see that he studied the ones from the Academy of Sciences in St. Petersburg and the typefaces from Isaac Jacob Schmidt very closely. So there are some relations. It's not identical, but I'm sure that he used the Schmidt type as being the inspiration of his typefaces. The first bold typeface, and the bold typeface is uh, again a typeface for uh, two typesets. Uh, uh, a secondary weight, like to give some attention to a part in uh, in the text, or in this case, actually to to write titles and to highlight the character set. But the first uh, fat or bold typeface was done by Gustav Schelter. It was used in some Tibetan uh, linguistic works from from Balhorn. It later also um, moved from Germany all the way to Europe. Uh, also was used a lot in in uh, London by the different type founders and, and printers. Um, but one of the largest collections of uh, typefaces um, for writing systems around the world is uh, the one from um, the Königliche und Kaiserliche Hof und Staatsdruckerei in Vienna, in Austria. And here it was Alois Auer, who was the director of this type foundry and printing press, and also I should say, part of the, the type fund, funding itself. However, he never designed any original typefaces. What he did, and you can see it already in one of the titles uh, pages here from his large type specimen book, and it's really impressive to see the pages are, are immense. I mean, they're the size of, of yeah, I, I don't have any dimensions here with me now, but in my book, I explain it in detail. Um, but each of the pages are really, yeah, uh, almost a zero size, if you come back, uh, translated to the DIN sizes now. So it's a very huge poster size. And he collected all the existing typefaces that were existing at that time. And we're talking around the 90s, sorry, 1840s, 1845 in Europe. So the ones from Rome, the ones from Parma, the ones from Paris, the ones from India even, he collected and he made a copy from them because he didn't may have uh, his own uh, uh, punches because they were preserved there. He actually made uh, use of some, um, we call it in uh, printing terms or, or uh, type funding terms, stereotypy. So we've got some pages of sending type and it's kind of, um, we would make a flong, which is made out of carton, uh, like carbon, carton, I think. Uh, and you would impress it on the page when you remove it when it was hard. It's like papier mache, you can, you can, it's, you have the impression of the text uh, inside, and then you can create metal type from these impressions. It's a different process and it's more complicated than the way I sound it here. Um, but that's how we actually made very close copies of these existing typefaces. And even in some point reduces uh, the typefaces. For instance, if you have this kind of wet uh, papier mache or carton, you could even stretch it when it's wet, and then you can have a typeface which becomes larger than the one because when it, it, it uh, dries, it, it shrinks. Uh, so that's why most of the time the, the type is a bit smaller than the original one. 
Um, but everything that he did um, was actually providing an example, which is beautiful because in this case, it's really an overview from what was actually being used at the time in 1806. But here you can see some examples and here is a copy from um, the Fantauzi type, also the type from uh, um, Gustav Schelter, which I showed earlier, but then a, a lighter version. Um, and because, yeah, he was also like kind of an, a clever mind and also an innovator at some point, he used his own point system and his own way of typesetting so that no one else could actually copy him unless you would know the system. So there's, he uses his own, own kind of way of, of typesetting. It's very intriguing, especially if you're more technical and if you're intrigued in, in how mathematics and everything, how he actually processed it and why he came up with it. Um, but it's again, another story. Uh, but here you can see some of the, the typefaces they, they actually produced for the Tibetan himself uh, in a different size. Here is a detail of his own um, typometry, uh, we call, he called it a uh, typesetting system, which is different than the Didot point or the Fournier point or uh, like the, the, the continental type height, which is different than the one in France and the one in England. And it's to do with how the printing press was made. The printing presses each had their different heights, uh, whether it was in England, whether it was in America, whether it was in, in Europe. So that's why each of the printers had their own kind of point system. And in France, it was Fournier who started it, but it's the Didot family who first shared or used Fournier, but then improved it to being like the Didot point and later the Douce point uh, type system that we have nowadays. Another typeface which became very, not popular, but very frequently used was the typeface for Tibetan, which was um, designed by the uh, yeah, British type foundry of Stephen Austin and Sons in Hertford. Here you can see an example of an advertisement uh, that the company made in 1885. The Tibetan you can see below the Russian and in between the Russian and the Hebrew type. But the type that he engraved um, was mainly used to translate the Tibetan texts for the Journal of the Royal Asiatic Society. And that's an important journal because um, the journal, so the, the Royal Asiatic Society was in contact with uh, the schools, uh, for instance, the Tibetan Study School here in France, in Paris. Uh, and they were communicating or exchanging articles or texts or discussions. And whether when it was regarding Tibetan, they also wanted to show the original text in the article. So that's why Stephen Austin and Sons created a new typeface initially for the Journal of the Royal Asiatic Society and later also to produce other Tibetan printed text. A bit later, you can see that in his type specimen book, um, that there's two different, uh, that he, they also, um, and my apologies, they also created a larger type uh, setting, uh, type size of 18 points um, yeah, for setting different texts. Um, but that's uh, the one that was very frequently used in that environment. I quickly give you a brief summary of the ones that I showed already. Fantautius, 1738, the first one. Shoma, Schmidt type mainly for missionary printing presses and grammar books, very important dictionaries. The Le Grand type from France, from the Imprimerie Nationale. Um, the Hour types in Vienna, Austria, and Stephen Austin in um, the UK. But the typeface that become the most used around the world is the one that was designed for the academic works and the literary work of Heinrich August Jeschke. Um, and together with Karel Richard Lepsius, uh, they were communicating. You want to go back? Oh, do you see something on the? Okay, now it's. I guess it's the connection with uh, the projector here. Sorry. Okay. Good. So um, the one that was used uh, most frequently around the world is also the one that is the best execution of the Tibetan characters, and that was produced for a dictionary or linguistic works that were created by the linguist Heinrich August Jeschke. Um, he was in contact with um, a known person, Karl Richard Lepsius in Germany, uh, who was an Egyptologist. Um, and he knew uh, a person who designed a hieroglyphic typeface for him. Um, and that was uh, a very known punch cutter in Germany of Berlin. That was uh, Ferdinand Teinhardt. And um, 
it's possible that um, also Tynard created uh, the type, the Tibetan that you can see here, and that was a typeface that uh, was used for um, the Reichsdruckerei in Berlin, and you can compare it with the Imprimerie Nationale in France of the Vienna uh, type foundry or the type foundry from St. Petersburg. That was a very large printing house uh, that could do multi-script printing, so multilingual typography. So it was one of the larger printing um, companies. Also, because it's indeed to do with the country itself, like uh, also to do with official documents that would be have been printed. And here is a very original typeface. It uh, was designed for uh, Karl Richard Lepsius uh, to produce some uh, linguistic work for Tibetan, uh, but in Germany. And it was Lepsius who um, communicated with Jeske um, to actually, uh, how should I introduce him to the person who actually designed his hieroglyphic typeface, and that was um, um, Ferdinand Teinhardt. Um, the typefaces of this Reichsdruckerei Tibetisch um, are also preserved, and it's not until recently, and it's 19, 2019, yes, right before uh, everything uh, stopped the line, and I was able to visit um, the Technique Museum in Germany, and they have quite a large archive and collection of printing material. And, and they have like a very large, a very large uh, collection or cabinets with different punches um, that are connected with Teinhardt. And these ones were preserved there. And most of us in the type world thought that they were lost due to the different wars or fires or anything. And it was very nice and relief to see that they are still preserved there. Um, here you can see the man himself, Ferdinand Teinhardt, uh, who uh, was actually introduced to Jeschke to produce the typefaces for this dictionary. And the dictionary, the Tibetan English dictionary that Jeschke provided, was an improvement of the work from Isaac Jacob Schmidt, also an improvement of the work of Shoma. And it became the standardized work to actually studying the Tibetan writing system, Tibetan um, uh, uh, writing system, language, sorry, and also the grammar, of course. And in um, Teinhardt was lucky, uh, luckily for us, he was able to write some kind of autobiography by the end of his life. Um, and he wrote uh, yeah, the way that he approached some of the typefaces that he produced, because he also designed different typefaces for all the writing systems. He said that, and I think it, it I mean, I, I'm sure that it's like a, a, a typo, like a mistake, that he actually used a 3,000 year old manuscript as uh, the model. That the Tibetan script was only invented in the seventh century. So 3,000 years uh, old is a bit too long. So if it would have been 300, that is more. Um, um, acceptable. Um, but what is indeed beautiful here is that um, the, the, all of the characters are according to the proportions that I showed you earlier that the scribes and the uh, sculptors would use. And the execution, execution of the fine lines, also the curves are very beautifully designed. Don't forget the punch cutter had to do it by hand. Um, engraving it with a loop, um, also like in mirror script because uh, of the printing. So it's really a big task to do it. Um, it was used not only for the dictionary, but also to print the first translation of the New Testament in Tibetan. So Schmidt did not do the Tibetan one, only the Mongolian. It was Jeschke who also worked with the uh, printing house of the Gebruder Unger in Berlin to produce uh, this translation. And you can see some examples here. The type specimen books from Teinhardt themselves, they also provide information of what he did. Uh, you have to, of course, to be a little bit to be careful if they are the original ones or that some of the type foundries who later uh, acquired the material of Teinhardt um, introduced these pages later. Uh, so you always have to be double checking with the resources that you read. But here, for instance, you can see one example of a type specimen which displays four different, um, well, three different uh, writing systems um, that he executed, Tibetan, Zen, and also two sizes of a Sanskrit one. The Tibetan is also shown together with the hieroglyphs that he did for, for Lepsius uh, in this uh, specific type specimen from around 1880. Um, one copy is left uh, in the same Wright library. 
And here you can see an example of some of the larger type sizes that he did because there was also a larger version um, being used, produced, not sure if he did it himself, for printing translations of other books um, uh, of the Bible. The Gebruder Unger type foundry in Berlin also used it to setting more complicated texts in Tibetan. For instance, here you can see some um, um, inscriptions which use as mantras, which use some astronomical and medical uh, kind of um, translations, also with reversed Sanskritized Tibetan shapes. So they were quite skilled in typesetting. And also the Oxford University Press used um, the typeface from Ferdinand Teinhardt. Here you can see Horace Hart, who was the head or the controller, as you would write it, um, of, they call it the Oriental Ship. It's that collection of the printing press that had to do with world literature and with uh, printing in different writing systems. And he regarded um, the skills of Teinhardt very highly. And because Horace Hart was very known as being a perfectionist and everything had to be precise and pure and detailed, and um, there's beautiful communication that I was able to see in also explaining how much it would cost him to actually, uh, he says that they are better than the ones from Stephen Austin in London, so we want new types. Um, the ones um, yeah, from uh, Fontatius are not good, so we want different ones. But because I was explaining that the printing presses in England are different than the ones in Germany, um, Deinart provided uh, also a list of how um, the, the, the type characters could be recast for Oxford Heights. And this as well um, reappeared uh, in the Technique Museum at the same time that I was visiting the archives. In the museum there, there was this large um, pamphlet basically that actually says, presumably, I can't say for 100% uh, sure that this is the handwriting of Ferdinand Tainer, but it's most likely because with the connection of the communication of Horace Hart here, um, um, because unfortunately, Tynard sent his type to uh, Oxford. It was not the right type heights. So um, Oxford had to melt everything. And you can see it here in a type system book uh, from, I think, 1906 uh, from um, uh, the, the printing uh, office at the time that actually lists each of the characters and typefaces that were there at the moment. That actually mentions here, you can see it on the left, that we have melted the double pica and we have a set of electrotype matrices, which is like different ones. They also uh, discarded the type case, and the type case is the wooden frame for the printer to uh, typeset to be used that Teinhardt himself provided, but they came up with their own um, layout for the type cases, which you can see here. Um, and the reason that this has a different layout is that a type case actually makes use of the frequency of each of the char individual characters. So in Latin, the box of the lowercase e, uh, would be the biggest one because you need the most E's in one single page. Uh, there is also the D, the N that are larger, but like W or even the Q. Uh, in French, it has a bigger, because the French layout is different than the one in Germany even. Germany uses a lot of capitals, so that's why each is different. And that's why they base themselves on. So luckily we have this kind of communication as well. They also made a smaller variation or a smaller version of it. Uh, which is called a two-line brevier. Uh, it's two sets uh, type, uh, how should I say, um, yeah, footnotes uh, or captions with images and you name it. And these uh, matrices, and that's actually where with the mold you can actually cast uh, the type, are preserved in the cabinets in the Oxford University Press in England itself. So these ones are the one from the smaller size that you can see uh, below the two-line brevier. Now, I said that Teinhardt's Tibetan um, was indeed the most used around the world because when it was being used in printing material, it was well uh, perceived and a lot of people um, yeah, were happy with it. And you can see not only Germany, Leipzig, also Oxford, Vienna used it later in Holland, Leiden, Spain, uh, here all over India. It was used also in Japan, uh, in Hong Kong, in Tokyo. And here are some examples of this type in use. So it's really regarded as, we can say it in typography terms, as the Times New Roman 
of the Tibetan, so to speak, or the Helvetica. I can't say Helvetica because it's not Sanserio or monolinear, but it's beautiful. Also in Darmstadt uh, in Germany, there exists some um, matrices to cast the type. Uh, here you can see some examples of uh, Japanese texts with the Teinhardt type. I was lucky enough to also use the cases. So here you can see um, me um, relocating the typefaces from Stephen Austin, which are in the British Library in London, and move them to St. Bride Institute in London, which is one of the biggest collections of printing material, uh, which had the Oxford type. And unfortunately, not, the cases were not always in the right order, so I had to relocate um, everything. Luckily, at these models um, of um, the, the type case provided by Oxford University Press, so I could actually make all the type uh, correctly in order again. And what I did with it um, is actually typeset a type specimen myself. I have a few copies here, if you like. Um, and it's to show not only, yeah, for me, it's, it's valuable to know how it's done to actually typeset the Tibetan myself, to see as a type designer myself how I can yeah, use inspiration from it, but it's also to compare the type sizes. So I use the same paragraph and also the individual sorts that you can see to show, okay, these were how many individual punches that uh, the person was actually uh, cutting. You can see some pages of the images from the process. And also two different ways of composing, because not only for Tibetan, but also for a lot of different other writing systems, we have different techniques of typesetting metal type. Here you can see the degree um, uh, composing method. And on the left-hand side, you see the diagram that you can compare it like a mosaic, that it's all put together. On the same page, you compile uh, the consonant and the sentence, and then you tie it up and hold it together. But because of the vertical stacking, you have different ways of casting it so that if there's a character on top, it needs to be positioned on top. You can't do it, otherwise there's some spacing issues. Um, once they are all cast, they come in a package. And these were actually from the type foundry sold to different printing houses. And then based on the layout of this type case, a printing office in Tokyo, a printing house in Leipzig, a printing house in Vienna, can actually distribute this type the sorts into the wooden cases themselves. And it also explains on the right hand side what was exactly in this package. And then depending on how many characters you need for the text, there's different packages that have been sold, uh, sent, sorry, yeah, sold to the, um, the printing houses. There is a second method, and that's the one that was in this case used by, for instance, Stephen Austin. And we call it in type composing uh, terms, the Akhant type system. It's derived from Indian uh, language. Uh, and it's actually, uh, it means the shoulder. And instead of having like individual mosaic tiles, you actually have one character you can see from the left that connects to the other. So it clicks into itself, into the other one. So the whole type setting is more solid. And if you would yeah, be a bit silly and drop it, it's more, it's, it's more sturdy here. So it's a bit more, Fast. Another important work in India was created uh, by Sarah Chandra Das, also an important dictionary for which new typefaces were designed um, as well. But here you see that Sarah Chandra Das very closely looked to the ones from um, Joma um, and um, paid also a lot of attention to the numerals. But also in Beijing, of course, in China, um, because I haven't been talking about uh, China and other regions of the world, um, they were also using in China a lot of uh, different printing types for different writing systems, especially during the era of Mao Zedong. Um, he produced a lot of texts that had to be translated so that each and every, um, how should I say, each and every uh, person in the mainland of China would understand um, uh, what he was saying. And if you see this uh, collection of works that were printed by the Foreign Language Express, which were mainly the works of Mao, the sayings of Mao, you can at least detect uh, six different printing types that were done for Tibetan only. Um, in the later versions, which also was making use um, of photo typesetting, but that's a technique I won't go into in too deeply, you can see one specific style. So here you can see the Mao 6 is like the six different individual typefaces from one 
a specific type foundry and printing press. But what's very specific for Tibetan typefaces that are produced in China is this um, condensed size. So on top of the two pages that you can see here, you can see that uh, the Tibetan type is a little bit condensed, uh, so vertically. I have an example here. And if you see digital fonts nowadays um, of Tibetan typefaces produced in, in, in China, you can see that this is a specific style that they would refer to and, and look forward to. It's a style that once you know it and see it, it's very well done and it's nicely used for titles or for parts of the text that need to be highlighted. Um, and it's a kind of a different reverse. It's not a reverse style, but it's like, uh, um, some strokes are thicker than the thinner ones, so it's more pronounced, so to speak. Um, and there's also one type printing press in Taiwan, the Wenzi factory, that also produced their own printing type. I've been visiting uh, the archives of the printing museum in Beijing, and they were very helpful. I was able, they provided me with these images here. Uh, but of course, especially in uh, the typesetting, uh, photo typesetting um, method in China, more research need to be done uh, in order to understand how the techniques and where the variations and the origins lie there, uh, which I would very much look forward to doing in the future or in other occasions. But um, in this part of the book, I really had mainly to rely on the printed works that I was available to access and also like the archives or the material in the printing press in museum. Now, I know that I'm running a bit late, but I want to go into another way of um, typesetting Tibetan, and it's not with printing presses, but it is with a machine that people could use back at home on their own desk, and that's actually the typewriter. And it might sound surprising, but yes, there exist also typewriters that were made especially for Tibetan writing system. And the first one that actually was um, providing Tibetan or how should I say, making it commercially available. I would say that it's more promotion, that it's a stunt, that it's a selling factor, was the very typer. The very typer is a typewriter machine. Well, it's an electronic type writing device, I have to say, which is different from an ordinary typewriter. And the name itself says, itself, it says what it uh, promises to do. The very typer is like this electronic device in which you can set variable or vary a variety of typefaces of scripts at the same time. An ordinary typewriter only has one type that comes with the model or with the brand of the typewriter, only one size, and that's it. The very typer makes use of what you can see here. They call it uh, type fonts. It's the first time that the word font uh, is actually used here. And it's um, a specimen from 1943. Uh, in which you can see this here and uh, under the changeable types you can see special type fonts so it's for me one of the first time that i see the word fonts being used which nowadays is referred to to digital typefaces for computer era um, and what it does is that you can have this uh, round um bakelite is that the right word it's bakelite it's like a material shaped um type fonts which you can position two by two um, at the same um, time machine. And then it depends on if you want to, for Latin, for instance, type Roman and italic, you only have to click and then it changes automatically and the italic is used at the same time. Also for bold, for instance, bold and Roman at the same time, bold or italic at the same time. But it means that it's also, it's also it can also use different writing systems, different scripts. So Roman and Tibetan, Roman and Arabic. It's a very easy to use device. Um, I had also, you have used uh, one of these machines uh, in the archives of the University of Reading. There's one example that's still available. Unfortunately, not Tibetan, but it's only the, the Latin uh, type fonts were available. I'll come back to that in a moment. Um, and it looks like this. You can immediately see that it has the flair or the characteristics of a, um, a typewriter font because um, it had to, uh, impress the inked ribbons um, um, to go on the paper, um, the type could not be very sharp. Because if you had like a typeface like Dido or Times New Roman, it would be too pointy and the ribbon would cut. 
So all the typefaces for typewriters have a more monolinear stroke style, which means that the thickness of all these strokes, whether it's horizontal or vertical, or more or less the same size, even the serifs. And it's really to do, one of the things is, it's also to do with the harder you impress that some parts might be lighter or bold uh, or, 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 or fatter. If it's more monolinear, you're more secure that it has the same color of the page. But as I mentioned in this type system of 1943, it shows, and this is an example which is in the St. Bright Library, I found it there. It also provides quite a numeral, uh, quite a number of, of, I think, 63 different writing systems, Arabic, uh, Punjabi, Devanagari, Hebrew, Bengali, you name it, and also Tibetan. Now, I have to say that I've never seen the original uh, metal bakalit plate. I have never seen a printing book printed with the very type press. So I'm not sure whether it was ever used. Um, I actually, because I based myself on the keyboard layout from the very typer and the Latin. And as you can see here, you can actually map where each of the characters could go on the uh, Latin keyboard layout or character sets. So you just need to yeah, align each of the Tibetan one with the, on the same line of the Latin type, if you understand what I'm saying. You, I could make or devise my own kind of keyboard layout. So that's what I did for the study. It's also in detail explained in the book. Um, but again, I haven't seen it being used. I made a digital font out of it. It's not beautiful because the shapes of this is, is very rudimentary. Also because yeah, some of the conjuncts are too small because it had to go on the typewriter, you see, and also it doesn't connect very beautifully. But this is a way to explain how the the keyboard is being used. Uh, so you can actually write Tibetan with the only 90 characters available on the keyboard layout. Remember, the specimen from 1870s in Petersburg says 325 sorts are needed. We are now reduced to 90, only 90 available keys or characters. So that's why it's a bit rudimentary, but some of the conjuncts are designed individually as subscripts, upscripts, and then it depends on the backspace and which key you need to enter that you can access a character that is yeah, typewritten below. I know it sounds a bit complicated, but again, uh, I hope it, it's a bit clear. Uh, the book explains everything in detail. The only work or publication I found which is very strange in a sense, is an American publication, uh, the Tibetan English Dictionary from Buck from 1969. And uh, I examined the, the, the pages and the Latin uh, typeface and also the spacing of the Latin characters does indicate, again, I'm not 100% sure, but indicate that it's typewritten with a very typer based on the Latin typeface that's been used. And also the Tibetan resembles very closely. The only thing is that the Tibetan typeface from this book, which was published by uh, Catholic University of America Press, the, let the Tibetan characters are smaller than the original very typer, the one that I found in the type specimen. And it's a one-on-one -on -one impression, so I could compare easily. So there's a big question mark for me why, why this happened. So again, that's the only publication which might be done with the very typer, but it's also the only one. However, and this is a very beautiful uh, novelty that I have to say, there is another typewriter, as I explained two more, um, and that's the one from Professor Michael Hahn uh, from Hamburg University, and um, he came to uh, Hamburg University in 1962, um, and he had to work for another professor, who at that time already had purchased um, a Tibetan typewriter, but it's not until and I'm not kidding, these images that I found here are only three weeks old, like the end of uh, August. And that's because I gave a talk on Tibetan typewriters at the end of August for contextual alternate. And one um, researcher and professor, Philip Streich, um, from Hamburg University was listening in. And I talked about um, uh, the typewriter of Michael Hahn, uh, who actually used this typewriter uh, to, to write his own uh, academic publications for his students to learn the language, to, to uh, teach Tibetan literature and uh, culture to um, the, uh, the students and the university. Um, but 
when I was communicating with uh, Professor Han, um, he unfortunately died in 2015, so it was before then, he didn't know where the typewriter was located. He said, yeah, I, I, I mean, from the 1990s, he used uh, other typefaces, uh, like met, uh, digital fonts. And it's not until like the end of August that uh, Philip actually um, inquired at university and at the Academy of the Tibetan Studies. And they didn't know anything, but it was the IT department that all of a sudden found something there and they were inquiring to throw it away or not. So I've not yet studied it. It's really fresh. So I would like to see how um, the keys are related to the, the, the handles and the Tibetan to see how it's done, because I'm going to very quickly quote um, Professor Han himself in an email that he wrote to me saying that, Typing was really slow because corrections were difficult to make and looked very ugly. And I remember well that typing one full page of Tibetan text required at least 75 to 90 minutes with uttermost concentration because most pages contained mixed texts, German and Tibetan. And he actually had to use two different typewriters, a German one or a Latin one for a German text and then move the page into the one for Tibetan. Um, and he really doesn't remember the average time required from one complete page to do like multi uh, script uh, typography or typewritten in this sense. But I'm very lucky that at least I have these images. I really hope to go to Hamburg someday to study it in detail or because as I hear or hear from Philip is they are not interested in a typewriter and I really don't want to see it being disappearing or being lost or thrown away. So. I'm very happy to purchase it or preserve it or anything, or, or I don't know what's going to happen, but it's very new things. And these are very interesting, um, um, should I say, uh, pages and text, because what we can see here, it's not a monolinear typeface. And presumably um, what um, Michael Hahn did is actually used um, the Tibetan that was sent to Oxford. And if you look very closely to the two-line brevier, that this was actually used to make the, um, the Tibetan handles for the Tibetan typewriter. Now, what I know, and that's something that you can see here, um, it's uh, the, the, um, the company, sorry, the Academy of, uh, of Sciences of Hamburg, um, the professor, which name I forgot, I can look it up very quickly and put it in the chat afterwards. Um, he actually had one device typewriter and he had sent it to Japan. And it's in Japan that he actually put the Tibetan keys on the Hermes font. So it's a different, it's a Swiss typewriter which was sent to uh, Japan and they actually mounted the keys for um, the typewriter uh, for Professor Han himself. So I'm very intrigued to see how it matches because it's not, it's not easy as I can see from this keyboard layout, and it's in a sense not very logical. I'll come back to that in a moment, uh, because as you can see, yeah, I'll, it's going to be too technical to explain, but um, it's a, the last typewriter, well, it's not the very last one, that I want to concentrate on is this one. Um, and that's the one from the Library of Tibetan Works and Archives, um, which opened in um 1971 to the public if i'm not mistaken um and uh, the director there um made some quite a lot of reports like from the beginning of 1971 um they already had a typewriter there to produce uh, books and publications from the uh, library of tibetan works and archives in Dharamsala, and to public to publish um academic books like really to to study or learn the language of Tibetan to each of the persons. Um, what the director said is that it was this Professor Ngawang Dondup Narkit, who was the inventor of the Tibetan typewriter for this Remington machine. Um, and you can see that there's a different way of uh, positioning the keys here. Come back to it in a moment. Here is one of the very known uh, publications and it's from 1986, but it's used all over almost India, even I learned my first Tibetan uh, with this specific book. Uh, and the whole book is, is typewritten with the typewriter. So it's a magnificent and beautiful example. But also uh, during the conference that I talk that I gave uh, in August for Contextual Alternate, um, it was uh, Vaibhav Singh, who also has a Tibetan typewriter in his collection. And that's a typewriter from the Godresh 
uh, typewriter company, and it's a Mumbai-based uh, typewriter company um, that actually devised uh, typewriters, which they say, well, they say it's truly that it is Indian-made typewriters because they really entered the market in India because it was predominantly dominated by foreigners, like uh, foreign typewriting companies who would produce typewriters for Indian writing systems, Tibetan, you name it. And the Godresh uh, company actually produced the typewriters in, in there themselves. So it's a very good um, um, alternative, basically, and, and having the knowledge and everything. But what's interesting here is that they actually have the identical uh, keyboard layout, and they actually use the completely same, almost same typeface. So in that sense, either they borrowed each other technology or the Remington um, came into uh, yeah uh, in contact with with Kodresh to actually study and do it. But uh, what can be seen here, there's two extra, um, there's one extra bar, like instead of the very typer, they only had three uh, bars. Here is a fourth one. Um, if you type it's ordinary, you have like the base characters, and these are really like I should say, but I don't like. Yeah, I'm going to do it. They are organized according to the Tibetan syllabary. So it's like the sequence, like ka, ka, ga, na, cha, 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 nya, etc. So it's really a logical sense. So it's not phonetically. Um, and if you type it normally, it's like the base characters. Um, the keys uh, on the left hand side are punctuation mark and vowel signs. Um, if you go on these specific characters, it's to um, uh, activate parts of um, uh, vertical conjuncts. Uh, that go below the base characters. Um, here you have um, the pre-composed conjuncts, so like combinations of two characters, which um, they made as individual keys. And this is done, uh, again, for reasons of the frequency, because they are used more frequently. Instead of using two different keys at the same time, you have this ligature of this conjunct that they can be uh, accessed at the same time. Um, and here again, you've got the uh, sessions of um, both Sanskritized, like it's a reversed, um, um, mirrored shaping of the Tibetan characters, um, and it's mainly to uh, types of Tibetan texts which are translated from Sanskrit or Sanskrit originated words, if I say it correctly, uh, correct me if I'm wrong. So it's to have like an origin from, from India. And of course, you've got the numerals, which is also very important. Um, so in total here, you've got 92 possibilities or, or options to typeset, which is an improvement. Again, this is like the, the most known um, publications. There's a second volume as well with grammar and language, which is used. Um, I also uh, made like an analysis of each of the different, um, yeah, how you can, which was included, how you can typeset it. Um, also, which of the uh, conjuncts that were included and not. Here's an example of the typewriter being used not just for educational text, but also for poetry and for artistic work uh, as Tibetan songs uh, from the Six Dalai Lama. And here you can see the comparison of both the very typer on the left hand side and on the right hand side, um, the Remington and the Godresh type founder, uh, typewriter, which uses the exact same uh, shapes of the characters and also the same set of numerals. There does exist also another typewriter, but uh, this is um, courtesy from Dr. Hira Troch. Um, it's flying fish and um, presumably, well, presumably, it's, the reason I'm saying presumably is that I haven't studied it very thoroughly yet. But the, what is weird here is that the keys don't match up with anything. So it might be that the, the, the plastic keys have been changed or anything. So I need to study how the handles are used. And um, the reason I'm saying that, uh, what I do know is that it's a Chinese uh, um, company who produced it because at home I have a um, um, typewriter for the traditional Mongolian script, also produced by the same flying fish company with also the handbook and the guidelines and everything. So that's the only thing, the reference I know that it's a Chinese company who made the Tibetan typewriter here. But I can't see the logic if you see even the numbers from the, the numerals, like two, three, four, and then five, six, seven on the right. I think there might be a mix up with the plastic uh, keys that go on top of the keys. So that's something we really need to investigate a little bit closer. 
But again, if we also compare the different uh, numerals, it's also not to be overlooked because uh, also for designing typefaces for nowadays uh, use, numerals are very important, um, so that's important. But nowadays we have different keyboards. We don't use any of the keyboards of the typewriters. We mainly use, um, well, there's three different ways or four different ways of keying in Tibetan on um, digital way or digital keyboards. What is mostly used is the Wiley keyboard uh, layout, which actually matches the Tibetan characters phonetically to the ones of the Latin uh, um, keyboard, which is in a sense practical because then you only need one computer and you can just choose the keyboard layout digitally. And then that you know that the F uh, would have like the fa uh, or like a, well, it doesn't exist the fa in, I know it's a wrong example, but the T would have the Tibetan ta. <laughs> so, yeah, I know. Yeah because I saw it, um, so that it matches like uh, phonetically. And there's also the QWERTY keyboard layout, because as you know, in Europe, we use, or French and Belgium, we use AZERTY most of the time. There's a QWERTY keyboard layout, which has different shaping, and there's also a Japanese input system, the OTANI one. Um, I made an overview of all the 35 different uh, metal printing types that I uh, studied in the book as well. I made a chart of it, also like the five different uh, typewriters. I know it's four, but uh, because the typewriter of book, uh, which is smaller, I included the version of book with the very typer as a separate one. Um, I also explain, of course, the early, uh, um, how should I say, developments of uh, digital fonts for Tibetan um, script, but I won't be going into detail in the digital fonts because I thought it was more important to talk about yeah, the, the aspects of uh, the printing types, typewriters. Um, I'm happy to give another talk about the digital fonts at another time, even by Zoom or anything, because it takes more time. And these are examples of the first ones that have been produced in the early 1990s. Here in this case of like um, an inkjet printer in which um, uh, not, not a, a matrix printer, dot matrix printer in, in which the, each of line of text is printed in three different moments. So it goes left to right, and then the whole line is being printed. So it's not printed in one go. Um, there is a beautiful, some beautiful Tibetan typefaces which make use of the Tainar typeface. So that's why the Tibetish from Tainar, it's still very much alive and still very much used in everyday life. So the Times New Roman comparison, I think, goes up very well. Here is Tibetan Machine Uni. It's a system font from macOS uh, made by Tony Dov and Chris Finn, who really draws closely to it. Also, Kailaisa. Um, from uh, Shohiro Nomura and Stephen Hartwell is also based on its more styles, but it's really the proportions and the, it's very close to, to the Tynart one. Um, here are some examples of um, typefaces which have been produced by um, Tibetan monks, Indian, um, sorry, Tibetan monks living in India, um, typefaces from Monlam, uh, the um, Monlam, um, collection, so to speak. On the left-hand side, you see a collection of Tibetan typefaces from the Chinese type foundry founder type. Um, there is Noto Sans from Toshio Magari, uh, which is like one of the Google fonts um, family typefaces for Tibetan in two weights, light and bold. Um, there is one, that, uh, two that I created, um, Lungta, a typeface, but also a more contemporary one, which is more monolinear. Um, and also the work from Elodie uh, Tournier, if I'm not mistaken, our surname, excuse me if I spell it wrongly, who graduated a few years ago from um, uh, Amiens, the School of Arts there. Uh, the type design program, she also designed a beautiful family of Tibetan typefaces. So you see, there's a lot of things happening and I think it's good. Uh, I recently gave a workshop on Zoom uh, for Chinese and Tibetan designers, uh, which was in February, which was beautiful. It was only aimed at Chinese and Tibetan speakers because it was translated simultaneously. So again, with most of the typefaces um, also for different writing systems of the world, I think more needs to be done and there, we need more designers. So I really encourage more people to design typefaces uh, for Tibetan so that there's a bigger collection to be used. Um, again, I mentioned earlier that everything can be read in more detail in my book. Um, I only have one copy here, but I don't have any more. I mean, you can find it at uh, 
uh, publishing house. If you need more ex, um, uh, information, feel free to contact me afterwards. Um, but I would like to thank you very much for listening. If there's any questions, please feel free to ask me. I'm happy to give answers also later via email or um, via, yeah, via chat or anything. Just, just let me know. I hope it wasn't too long. No, but uh, <laughs> thank you. Uh, thank you.